me say good afternoon for everyone here and thank you actually for joining us today. Uh, my name is Walid, uh, Walid Magdi. Uh, I'm a fellow at the Alan Turing Institute and actually I'm also an associate professor at the School of Diplomatic at the University of Edinburgh, uh, where I lead actually the social uh, media analysis group there. Uh, this is actually one of the Turing lectures uh, under the flagship lecture series, uh, which have been running since 2016 and virtually since April, uh, of course, after, uh, unfortunately after the lockdowns. Uh, so the last few months we have been running it virtually. Uh, it's actually free for all to attend and we, all, we aim actually to have this open and accessible as possible. In this mini series, especially since the lockdown, we have been looking uh, at some of the technologies behind the UK response to COVID uh, lockdown. Uh, each month, our distinguished speakers uh, explore a different theme that have been affected, uh, that have been affected as us individually and as a society since the world that went into lockdown uh, and how we emerge from it and the possibility of going back into it at any given moment, hopefully not. Uh, as a world that actually comes to term or with learning how to live with the virus. So before going uh, to the talk, uh, there are a few housekeeping notes that uh, I hope that everyone would uh, know about it. Uh, first of all, you, uh, this lecture, it will be subtitled. So uh, if you cannot see the subtitles, you can actually uh, click on the CC po uh, button at the bottom in the toolbar on the screen. Also, actually, we will be posting on the chat uh, a link if you'd like to see these captions and subtitles in a separate window. So hopefully this would be helpful for anyone to use. Uh, very importantly, uh, through the lectures, you might have some questions uh, for the speaker. So uh, there is actually, if you can look at the bar down there on, on Zoom, you'll find there is a QA and A function. This one, please use it and post uh, your question at any time. Uh, also, if you'd like, actually, you can post it uh, online uh, on uh, on Twitter and use the hashtag Turing Lecture. So we will be following questions online as well. I would actually recommend before you post a question, uh, have a look on the existing ones. If you think there is one of the uh, questions uh, very similar to the to yours, so please upload this one because actually after the end of the lectures, we might end up with a lot of questions. So we'll be going with the most popular questions. So please, before posting uh, your question, have a look and be sure that no one asked this before. Uh, also, we actually encourage all of you to uh, uh, post on, on this lecture on Twitter. So if you if you have a nice, interesting part of the slide you'd like to talk about it, just uh, write about it on Twitter. Uh, but we recommend that you can use the uh, hashtag Turing Lecture. And of course, if you can uh, tag uh, the Turing Institute uh, account, it would, it would be great. Be sure, uh, just to know, we are recording this lecture and it actually would be broadcasted on YouTube as well. And we will actually post a recording of this lecture on YouTube afterwards. So uh, if you missed any part of it, you will be able to see it later. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, another thing, actually, uh, we still would love to have more feedback from you. So we'll be actually using some few light bulbs throughout the lectures using Slido. Uh, you can see this uh, from uh, the links. And if you have any ex experience with technical glitches, for example, this is online, so hopefully nothing would happen. But if there is any problem, uh, please bear with us and uh, we will try to uh, uh, make it working fine as soon as possible. So uh, without going any more further, I'd like actually to introduce our speaker today, which is Professor Desmond Upton Patton. Uh, actually, Professor Desmond is a public interest uh, is a public interest technologist and a pioneer in the use of social media and AI in the study of gun violence. Uh, actually, he is the founding director of the Safe Lab and the associate professor of social work, sociology, and data science at the Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Patton studies the way in which the gang involved uh, youth uh, conceptualize threats uh, on social media and the extent of which social media shapes and facilitates youth and gang violence. He is currently developing an online tool for detecting aggression in social media posts uh, in partnership with the Data Science Institute at Columbia. As if, it, uh, as, as if we, we weren't obsessed with the social media enough before COVID-19, lockdown actually gave us even more uh, uh, of the incentive to post, tweet and book and gram. But what effect uh, what effect is the, the, is that having on the most vulnerable members of our society and how we use data science and AI to protect them? Actually, and now I'm going to hand over to uh, Desmond 
And actually, we hope he can shed more light on this, and we are excited to learn more about the work he's doing. Wally, thank you so much. And it is uh, so great to be with you all. Good afternoon and good morning uh, to everyone. I am going to now share my screen. Let's see how this goes. OK. Um, so again, I'm just so happy to be with you. My name is Desmond Patton. And for the past eight years, I've studied the relationship between social media communication and gun violence, uh, and then specifically in the city of Chicago. Uh, I define myself as a digital qualitative researcher and a public interest technologist. So what this means for me is that I care about the narratives individuals and communities write in digital spaces like Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And I'm interested in how we build better ethical computational tools that leverage those stories to hopefully eradicate social inequality and promote good health and well being. Um, I'm also actively working to partner with youth and community members to develop contextually driven context, uh, computational tools that use social media to prevent, intervene in the transmission of gun violence. So this work is powered by the SAFE Lab, for which I am the director. We are a hodgepodge of folks. We are social workers and computer scientists, um, undergraduate students, uh, community members, youth. Um, and we have been working together since my time at Columbia, um, which started in 2015, uh, to really understand social media as an ecological environment and what might social media offer as a window into the gun violence problem in the United States? And can it be used as a tool for prevention and intervention? One thing I think is important to, to state in the beginning before I delve into my research is that many of the things that I've done earlier in my career with my research, um, I now think differently about it, um, in particular issues around ethics and consent when leveraging social media for gun violence prevention. And so I will um, interject those ideas um, as we go through uh, the notes today. So my introduction uh, to the impact of social media on gun violence actually came by way of young Black youth in Chicago who talked to me about a beef uh, on Twitter in 2012 between two really well-known rappers. Chief Keef and Little Jojo. And the issue unfolded as such. They were both from the South Side of, of Chicago and both um, identified as being a part of uh, different um, opposing gangs on the South Side. Um, they have, were both up and coming uh, rappers and had large followings. Uh, they began to kind of make fun of each other, to pick on each other on Twitter and then it began to escalate over time as individuals from their various camps began to kind of amp them up. And so little Jojo uh, was tired of the back and forth on Twitter and essentially said, if you wanna do something about this beef that we're doing on Twitter, let's meet up. And so he posted his exact location and within three hours he was murdered in that exact location that he posted on Twitter. Um, and so I became really interested in the impact that social media has on gun violence. Was it an amplifier? Was it a facilitator? Uh, was it was it a was there any causal links that we should know about? Um, or was it just the same old, same old, um, and just an accelerator of sorts? And so um, I went to the literature uh, to learn more about this phenomenon, thinking there would be a lot more. And there was essentially zero articles on this new phenomenon. And so with, um, with some colleagues from the University of Chicago, we decided to um, uh, pursue this a bit further. But first, let me give you some background as to why social media and violence is particularly critical for the city of Chicago. And so this work is motivated by the fact that violence remains a critical public health issue in Chicago. Um, a total of 764 people were murdered in the city in 2016, which is where we began to do a lot of this work. Uh, between 2015 and 2016, the city experienced a 58% increase in homicides and 53% more non-fatal shootings. Um, annual increases of this size are not unprecedented among American cities, uh, but are rare for the city of Chicago. Um, and some of you might be wondering what is happening in the city now, where the city had a lull in violent events between 2018 
2019, but as it relates to COVID-19, uh, we're seeing again, uh, another increase in violent offense. At the same time, youth have fully embraced social media and often the family experts on how to use various social media platforms. Uh, but youth stated motivation for using social media is quite similar to traditional forms of communication, uh, to stay in touch with friends, uh, make plans to get to know people uh, better and to present um, oneself to each other. Um, data from the Pew Institute suggests that 92% of youth are online daily. 71% use more than one social media site and those teens that are on social media. 45% um, of black teens are also using Twitter. Again, this is older um, data as well. But as you might imagine, what could also be happening uh, during the lockdown or that we're seeing much higher usage rates among teens, among youth more generally, um, to share their lives, to talk about how they're coping with COVID-19, to better connect with friends, to um, study, right? Because social media has now become an integral part in how young people are um, uh, engaging the educational uh, process. And so now more than ever, so many people are living and sharing their lives through social media. So as I said before, I wanted to learn more about this phenomenon. And so I turned to the literature and there was nothing there. And so I partnered with my classmates from the University of Chicago and we wrote a conceptual paper um, in an effort to define and draw parameters around this new social media behavior that we had just learned about from youth in Chicago. Um, and so in this article that you see before you, we termed the, we coined the term internet banging um, and defined it as a form of social media communication where individuals who identify with gang involvement use social media sites like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, uh, the list goes on to trade insults or make violent threats um, that have the potential to lead to physical harm or death. And in this paper, we argue that internet banging is a cultural phenomenon that has evolved from increased participation with social media and represents an adaptive structuration or new and unintended uses of existing online social media platforms. So this paper made a big splash because I think that um, the media had been writing about these new behaviors that they were hearing about, but there was no academic article to validate some of these insights. Um, so the, con the conceptual paper helped to define some of these parameters, but we had not done any empirical work. And so one of the first things that I did is that I wanted to connect with youth violence workers in the city of Chicago. I wanted to connect with social workers um, to begin um, initial qualitative work to understand how young black men and boys who were living in the city, some who are, were gang involved or had experiences with the carceral state may have insights about the role of social media. And so we partnered with, um, in 20, around 2013, 2014, we partnered with the YMCA Violence Prevention Program. And this was their then director, Eddie Bocanegra, um, who, was the uh, executive director and he allowed us to work with young people who are part of his program um, as a part of our interviewing um, and we he also helped us to identify um, outreach workers throughout the city that could inform some of our work as well uh, this this connection with Eddie and the YMCA was a critical step because number one, it was our entry point into the community. And I have to say, Eddie kind of put me through the ringer. He wanted to make sure that in doing this research that we were not harming young people, that we we're not using this work against them. And I appreciated that, um, guard, that guardrail for our work. Um, and it also allowed us to have a relationship where we can continuously go back and um, work with young people um, later on in our research as well. And so now I'm going to talk about a couple of um, qualitative insights that we have derived from some of that earlier work in Chicago. Um, so this first study is insights that we have gleaned from outreach workers. And so we spent time interviewing around 
35 to 40 violence outreach workers in Chicago. These outreach workers are individuals that are normally from the community in which they serve. Um, some of them had uh, prior gang involvement or had been a uh, justice involved and they were now working as part-time or full-time outreach workers. Um, these folks were very much aware of what was happening on social media and had a lot of things to say. So one of the things that we learned from this work is that uh, outreach workers understood that one of the reasons youth engage in tough conversations online is that it's related to att gaining attention and power from one another. So again, um, evoking this idea that youth development and understanding youth development is an important part of this process and understanding that for youth, their peer engagement is the most important, most important part of their development. Outreach workers also believe that youth's ability to communicate how they want and curate an identity online provides a sense of power that could be hard to attain in everyday life. Uh, and then lastly, another important contribution of the outreach workers is the insight into the social norms of online privacy for youth um, navigating ongoing gun and gang violence in the neighborhoods. And so the outreach workers in our sample suggest that youth they work with often do not have their social media accounts protected or set private, but continue to post information that could, that could potentially incriminate them. And so the, it, it leaves them in a very vulnerable space because they are engaging the social media platform in a way that provides the world insight into their daily life. And yet um, many of them at the um, at this particular juncture um, were not um, either didn't know or weren't engaged in some of the privacy settings that may or may not provide them with some shelter um, from these uh, peering eyes, if you will. And then we also spent time with around 50 black boys and men that were um, affiliated with the YMCA and also other, um, other violence prevention agencies in the city of Chicago. And we learned a lot from these young men. Um, first, it became clear, again, this is during a time where Twitter was a bit more um, popular with young black youth, um, but Twitter accounts of prominent gang involved youth have a large number of followings. And so as a consequence, these individuals or their surrogates may, uh, who, may be, who may be doing the actual tweeting have considerable impact on the perceptions, cultural values, and the actions of a large number of individuals. These are individuals that we now call um, influencers. Uh, second, messages of violence, uh, dominance, and retaliation among gang involved individuals are transmitted quickly uh, and efficiently on social media, often fueling threats of violence online. The messages transmitted via social media um, especially Twitter at the time by gang about individuals uh, is an important um, function of how a lot of violence and fights would happen in the city. Uh, again, uh, something else that's important to you um, underscores that there's no instruction manual or a set of um, FAQs to guide total followers in their interpretation or responses to the posting of individuals who are, um, who may be uh, gang involved. Um, and so again, we are all left to our own devices in terms of making sense of what we're seeing online. And that could have issues that could raise many concerns uh, within uh, youth groups and from a policing perspective of individuals that are now viewing the interactions between young people as well. And then finally, and perhaps maybe one of the primary concerns is that the call to action that may be explicit in many tweets or Facebook posts or Instagram posts um, do not go unheeded in many instances. And so such calls respond to many aspects of what Elijah Anderson calls the code of the street, which emphasizes toughness, maintaining respect, and, and responding to threats. And so our next set of studies focused on actually analyzing the social media posts of youth who self-identified as gang involved. Now, this is an area where I think we have to have very serious ethical discussions. And at the time, the, I think the research parameters allowed for us to um, scrape uh, Twitter posts that are publicly available um, without having consent because they are publicly available. And our research study went through the proper IRB channels and had no pushback whatsoever. Now, I, I'm not so sure that is the right way to do this. Um, we tried extremely hard to get consent from young people. We 
we hired other young people to reach out to young people. We spent time trying to send messages to young people on social media. But as you might imagine, a 16 year old is not gonna be very excited to speak with um, some Columbia professor that they've never met. And so we ran into extreme challenges, but at the time thought that the work was important enough to continue with the work. But I think we have to think very critically about whether uh, the extent to which we need consent to do this work and how not having consent can be um, detrimental to youth that are involved. So the most life-changing um, Twitter account that I've ever um, uh, experienced is the one from Jakira Barnes. And I wanted to better understand some of the qualitative insights we were gleaming from Chicago black boys and men and from outreach workers. And so around 2014, I'm sitting in my office at the University of Michigan and I come across um, this, uh, this news story about the gun toting gang girl of Chicago. And it was about Jakira Barnes. Um, Jakira is a deceased self-identified gang involved um, youth who was killed by rivals in April of 2014. Uh, important to note is that by the time Jakira was 17, she had allegedly um, shot or killed up to 20 people um, as a member of the Gangster Disciples on the south side of Chicago. Now, again, you know, this young woman had a mythology that brewed and manifested itself on Twitter, and in many ways, the accounts and experiences may or may not be true. And so I became really fascinated by her life because, number one, uh, it's not uncommon for young girls to be a part of gangs, but it is uncommon for a young woman to have this type of positionality as a shooter or a hitter um, in a gang. And then she also had quite the Twitter following in exchange. So as you can see, she had over you know, 26,000 tweets and almost 5,000 followers, which at, the, which at the time in 2014, put her in the 95th percentile of Twitter user engagement. Um, she also left some really interesting pieces um, to her kind of short bio um, and her images. So things like youngest in charge, 0634, which we would learn would be um, the beginnings of an address on the south side of Chicago. And then she would also identify um, different names of her gang. So hashtag STLEBT, TMB, these are all kind of um, signals that would suggest her association with a particular gang and then the hashtag CPDK, which was Chicago Police Department Killer. And so we can get more, um, we can learn more about that as well. Um, so with um, Jakira's Twitter account, I combine qualitative machine learning approaches to analyze her communication uh, with her users in her Twitter network. I also hired youth from Chicago, from the same neighborhood, to interpret and translate culture, nuance, and text and images from that data set. And I then hand labeled tweets, searching for themes and patterns um, uh, in the data. And then in our process, we hand over our social media corpus to data scientists who will use natural language processing and computer vision to automatically predict into and detect those things within the Twitter data set. So again, we're not predicting violence offline, we're predicting um, text within the social media platform. Um, something that's also important to know, uh, Jakira was never um, charged with any of the shootings or um, murders that were associated with her, um, but in a, in a morbid modern irony, it's likely that she revealed her location in real time to her killer through a tweet. And, uh, to this day, uh, her killer has not been arrested as well. So one of the, once we started to dig in to um, Jakira's tweets, I have to say another issue is that we had imbibed so much negativity about Black youth in Chicago, about Black gang-involved youth, that the first things that we wanted to pay attention to um, were threats and aggression. And when that's your framing, that's your mindset, well, then you're, you're going to find uh, plenty of examples of that. And we did. And so we found things like Vernon, that's the gun line across the unit from the headlines. Vernon is a street um, on the south side of Chicago, which uh, is, a, is a demarcation between uh, two different gangs. It's also a lyric from a rap song. And so in many, um, in some instances, it becomes very complicated to discern whether or not the lyric has deeper meaning beyond uh, uh, what's being said. But then we started to see something different. Uh, when we started to spend more time 
with Jakaira's tweets. When we started to spend more time with youth from Chicago and asking them to help us discern these tweets, we realized that we were missing so much about Jakaira. Um, she grieved heavily, she mourned heavily, she experienced so much loss. She loved, she had joy, she had happiness. And she expressed so much of that on Twitter. Actually, she expressed that more often than expression, uh, expressing uh, grief or aggression. I'm sorry, uh, more than expressing uh, aggression. But again, the framing that you bring to these interpretations can quickly shift how you view uh, the, the, the users that may be involved. Um, and so again, this is another area where we, we really needed to slow down. We really need to check ourselves and our interpretations, our, our own biases. Um, and this was a, an important learning lesson for me as a black man who spent so much time in Chicago, realizing that I, um, as a black man, do not have the requisite skills to interpret these social media posts. I didn't have the, the requisite background to do this work justice. And having that revelation, I think, was a critical step in how we continue to move forward. And so, in again, one of our earlier papers, uh, we wanted to um, really understand the extent to which uh, social, the social media behaviors that we were seeing from Jakaira and her users was this the same behavior that we see on the streets. Um, and so in this paper, uh, Gang Violence on the Digital Streets, we found evidence of social media communication that appeared to resemble features that characterize gang-like behavior. So things like status seeking and seeking retaliation for a fallen friend um, showed up as in text and images on platforms on platforms like Twitter and Instagram uh, that Vajikara and her other users were um, uh, involved in. So another light bulb moment for us is that you know, we didn't know what the hell young people were saying online. We had no background understanding for what was being said. And so we realized that we also needed a methodology uh, to, to slow us down, to have a more naturalistic interpretation of what was happening, and to really kind of um, force ourselves to check our biases, to check our misinterpretations um, during this process. And so we, uh, we developed the CHASM method, which is the contextual analysis of social media approach. So through CHASM, which is, you see a tweet here, which is an example of how we might decipher and unpack a tweet. Um, we provide a methodological process to contextually, uh, to contextually and process to, to um, label social media data for the training of algorithmic systems. And so the CHASM approach serves as a method to bridge the identified gaps between inadequacies in current language processing tools and differences in geographic, cultural, and age-related variants of social media use and communication. And so CHASM focuses on utilizing a team-based approach to annotating and qualitatively analyzing social media data explicitly grounded by deep community expertise and understanding. This process yields rich qualitative analysis as well as in-depth annotations that can easily feed into a natural language processing system to improve accuracy for, this, for our work. However, the focus on context also offers an opportunity to think about the ethical risks of this project that are directly related to um, what improving accuracy enables, the prediction and detection of human behavior. And so on one end, we want to have deep context to make sure that we're not grossly misinterpreting social media. But what happens when you accurately interpret the social media posts from vulnerable Black youth on the south side of Chicago? Is that helping them or harming them? And that becomes one of the things, one of the ideas that we keep having to come back to and wrestle with and have tensions with in our work day to day. As I mentioned before, our domain expertise is an important aspect of this work, and it has been a game changer in how we see and view the work that we do. And so normally, when I work with computer science colleagues, you know, domain expertise is someone that has a PhD who may be a social scientist who has domain of a particular um, area of, of work. Here, we have flipped it on this head and have said that these young people um, are the experts on their own lives, the experts on their own communities, and experts on the language 
and culture that we see on social media platforms. So they are the experts in our work and they um, initially would help us translate and interpret social media posts. Um, they would give us backstories or help us to uh, um, unpack uh, various meanings that would be really hard to unpack without their direct knowledge. And then they also became our ethical guides. They would, we would have deep conversations with them about the extent to which we are doing harm or being helpful. We would have conversations with them about how to integrate this work. We have conversations around the utility of this work and should we be doing this work? And I think one of the most important things that I found and you know, what I learned from young people, from our domain experts is that they were okay with the use of social media as a way of keeping them safe. They, had, they would say over and over again, if you're keeping us safe and it keeps us away from creepy adults that wanna harm us, then by all means, please have these types of tools. What they were not okay with is gross misinterpretations that lead to increased problems for them in terms of um, um, involvement with the police. And so they oftentimes felt like adults, people like me, educators, attorneys, law enforcement could misinterpret what they were saying and that could lead to uh, further problems with them. Um, and partnering with our domain experts were uh, social work students. And so our um, domain experts brought a deep contextual level of information around how we may understand the social media world. Our annotators then put themes and patterns around that communication so that we could have nice labeled uh, data sets that um, um, but spoke to the qualitative insights that we deemed and gleaned from our domain experts. So now I wanna walk you through the application of the CASM process. So in order to apply CASM, we realized that we needed a web-based annotation system. And so we created VATAS, which is the Visual and Textual Analysis System. So our research team initially qualitatively analyzed tweets from gang-involved youth using Excel spreadsheets to capture text and emoji. The process was radically in inefficient and made it difficult to visualize the data from a dynamic, naturalistic perspective. Uh, so to counter this limitation, we developed the systematic approach to analyzing these posts. Um, and having access to previous posts, which is an integral part of the annotation, uh, the user's social network and images and conversations provide important contextual clues about how content becomes aggressive on social media. So that is the reason why we decided to create our own uh, uh, annotation system. And so here we start with having the annotator, which is normally a social work student, but anyone can put themselves in the shoe, um, uh, give a baseline interpretation of a tweet. So here we're gonna work with this tweet. I've been up for like three days straight, um, you know, and then the two corresponding emojis. And so when we first asked the annotator to tell us what's happening in this post, they don't have much to say. It's not really helpful. It's not really useful. They say he hasn't slept in days. So we all could have gleaned that from the social media post. Then we asked the annotator to go through a, a step-by-step -step procedure for eliciting context, right? And so we asked them to go back to the original social media post. Uh, we asked them to look at a set of web-based resources, things like Hip Hop Wiki and YouTube. We've cu cu curated a host of um, resources so that when they slip or they don't have an information around a particular text or image, they can then identify that. They then go and look at the author's post. Um, they look at the peer network. This becomes extremely important. So someone may claim to be gang involved. We look at their peer network and then they're following Disney uh, characters. So uh, that kind of uh, um, mismatch is an important um, clue for us. Look at offline events. Offline events that happen in the community, at school, at church and home shape how we might interpret language and images. We look at the virality of a post. We pay attention to people who are influencers, who have lots of followers. We look at how far reaching those posts are because it also shows the directionality of potential posts. And then we look at who's engaging those posts as well. And so all of these, all these things to extract context happen. And now we ask you to go back to that social media post. Now the annotator has a lot more to say. They say this user is saying that he hasn't been up for three days. He's been up for three days straight, most likely meaning he hasn't slept. The post comes days after his friend was killed. 
Uh, this user may be having difficulty sleeping because of his friend's death. And then he includes a persevering emoji and a flushed face emoji. So now we have a lot more context as to how we might interpret this post. And this is important for the actual labeling process. And so um, we have a labeling process that um, these particular codes came out of our earlier qualitative work. And so the two main themes that came out of our work with Jakaira and other users in our network were things around grief and aggression. The hardest thing for me as a social work scientist is to then to lump everything else as other, but to partner with our computer science colleagues, uh, it made it cleaner for them to have a binary classification and everything else to be considered other. I think these other codes are extremely important to helping us to decipher and understand who Jakara was. And I think that in our future work, being able to leverage and um, use more context is an extremely um, um, important part in doing this work ethically as well. And then before we hand off to our data science colleagues, um, we go through a community validation and recon uh, reconciliation process, right? Where we go back to those domain experts. Um, we would um, talk to outreach workers and then go back to those domain experts. Um, we would then I, and have them look at what our social work students have already done. And then we look at the points of disagreement between our social work students and our domain experts um, from the community. And we study those disagreements and we write papers about those disagreements. Um, many of those disagreements come around community level items like place and uh, context. Our domain experts had these deep and rich backstories around people and uh, death, around clothing, around um, hand gestures that our annotators just didn't have. And so that information would then be, be leveraged by the annotators to then provide a final code. And so that final code would then be delivered to our um, uh, data science colleagues at Columbia. Um, so again, so we've done qualitative work, we've done digital qualitative work, and now uh, members of the SAFE lab have then moved into being able to leverage natural language processing, including neural nets and computer vision to be able to see to what extent we can actually predict um, aggressive um, communication within the platform. Again, this is not a causal link to physical violence, not you know, uh, trying to predict violence offline. So these are my colleagues. This is um, uh, Kathy McEwen, very world renowned uh, computer scientist who studies text summarization and then another very well known uh, 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 a computer scientist and electrical engineer, uh, Shifu Chang, um, who directs the digital media multimedia laboratory. So I've partnered with these two individuals and in their labs for the past five years. And so the objective um, with our artificial intelligence work um, was to develop an artificial intelligence system that can automatically detect aggression and loss in media posts from gang involved youth in Chicago. Um, again, we had uh, employed su supervised learning and natural language processing to include discrete features that are extracted from text and labeled later as aggression, loss, and other. And then as we, move, as we progressed in the work and increased our experiments, we also included semi-supervised learning and neural nets, which also um, included word embeddings and unlabeled plus data as well. And so in, this, in our first work together, uh, we started off very, very, very small because honestly, we were quite concerned that none of these artificial intelligence systems, this natural language processing tools will be able to decipher language online. And we were very much correct. And so we started off more with a thick data approach. And so we had a training data set of 616 tweets, um, a development uh, set of 102 tweets and a test set of 102 tweets. And then we also manually um, annotated with parts of speech taggers. And so we uh, present this paper and this earlier work in a colon 2016 paper. And so in this paper, we work with a data set of tweets from Jakira Barnes and individuals in her data, um, in her user uh, network. Uh, we use the data set to develop a system that automatically detects grief and loss. Um, the ultimate goal of our work is to alert community outreach groups when aggressive tweets are identified so that they can intervene uh, to alleviate potentially violent situations. And so the data set again contained 820 tweets. Um, the data was partitioned into a training set, a development set. Um, and then the training and development set come from March and April of 2014. Um, the test set comes from tweets from January of the same year. 
Um, in this earlier paper, we developed a part of speech tagger for the gang sublanguage and applied machine learning translation alignment to produce a phrase table that maps the vocabulary they use to standard English. Um, as you might imagine, that was a very complicated process and a process that I'm not sure was necessarily very helpful, uh, but it was a starting point for us. Uh, the features of the emotion classifier included parts of speech taggers, um, and we also uh, and we also used the, the, uh, the dictionary of um, affect and language um, when uh, trying to represent quantitative scores that would um, um, identify the words that were being um, used. Um, our supervised classifier was able to recognize lost tweets uh, with 62.3% um, F measure or accuracy, and the aggression tweets um, were at 63.6% accuracy, improving over the baseline of about 13.7 uh, points uh, for aggression and around 5.8 um, points for loss. And so this was just, again, some of our earlier work um, leveraging uh, NLP in this space. Um, then we actually moved forward um, to, um, to increase the contribution that we wanted to make. And so we then uh, went forth with a new study, which had a new label data set, which was six times larger than the prior work. And then we also used domain specific resources induced from unlabeled data sets. And so we applied a neural net approach there. And then we also used context features that capture semantic and emotional content in users' recent posts. In their, in their interactions with other posts. And so when we, uh, when we um, use this new re resource of context, um, the F measure was almost uh, 70%. And so many of you may be asking, okay, well, should it be higher? Um, and why isn't it higher? What does it mean for us to be extremely accurate in this space? Another issue is, um, do we have measures in, in place within this particular system to ding us when we may be misinterpreting some of the interactions that we're seeing online? And so again, this is a movement, our earlier movement towards trying to support social workers and outreach workers um, in their quest to use social media as a part of their violence prevention uh, uh, strategy, but there are still a, a lot of concerns that we have around, well, what happens if you have 100% accuracy? What happens if someone else uses this system? Um, folks who may not have the same sets of values or ethical agreements or work with the community, how might, this, how might this tool be used against those communities? And so again, with every process, with every new contribution, with every new step, we're constantly worried and, and thinking through um, how these tools are used. Uh, and it's important to know that none of these tools um, have been made uh, public. Um, we have not partnered with, uh, uh, with police or law enforcement to use any of these tools. And this is all using historical data, so none of it is in real time. And then uh, lastly, we partnered with Shea Foods Group um, to use computer vision to look at uh, different ways images provide information around context. Um, one of the things that we learned two things that computer vision was really helpful with identifying um, aggression. So things like a handgun uh, or uh, substance use because it was more clearly aligned in terms of interpretations. Um, natural language processing was better with interpreting things like loss and grief um, as well. This is an example of the types of images that would be a part of our data set. These are not images from our data set. This is from a stock Google um, uh, file, but we wanted to give you a sense of the types of things that we would see um, in the uh, data set as well. So, um, so much has happened uh, post lockdown that I think uh, is a continuation of the concerns that we've had around the impact of social media on gun violence, but also raises new ethical issues in how social media is used as a monitoring and surveillance tools. And so what I think the lockdown has presented for us is that social media has illuminated the intersections of COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the criminal justice system. 
And so on the one hand, as social media users spend so much more time on social media, sharing experiences with COVID-19 or organizing protests for Black Lives Matter movement, city governments like the one in Chicago are also concerned about social media being weaponized against the city and business owners. So the Chicago Police Department has long monitored uh, social media activity as a policing strategy. Uh, but now we'll be on the lookout for organizing or, or plans for looting that may be associated with the Black Lives Matter protests. And so the mayor of Chicago is convening a task force to monitor social media activity for looting. However, these discussions lack a critical evaluation of the potential for misuses, uh, misinterpretations, and an, infring and an infringement on protected speech. So as you might imagine, there is some deep complexity that I think you need to sit in while applying these tools. On one end, what I know from my work is that young people can die and get hurt based on what they say and do on social media. But I also know that on the other end, that young people, the type of tools that we can use to intervene or potentially protect can be used against and weaponized against those vulnerable youth um, as a new method for mass incarceration. And so we need to work towards solutions and ideas that are not quick, that are interdisciplinary, and that are hyper-inclusive of those community members um, in order to really get our minds around this very complex problem. So as I said before, um, the ethics of this work is something that keeps me up at night. And um, I struggle with it a lot as a social worker. And I haven't been able to find frameworks that I think are emblematic of that complexity. Oftentimes liberal academics are saying, don't use artificial intelligence to, um, to um, look at issues of gun violence on social media, you are infringing on public, uh, on public speech, and all of that is true. And then when I ask them, well, have you had that conversation with a mom who lost their child who was killed because of something they said on social media? And what would you say to that child or to that mom or to that dad or to that brother or sister that um, that really just wanted their child to be alive? And what do you tell them and how do you work with them? And so I think that any ethical approach has to sit within that complexity. And so in our ethics discussion, we attempt to wrestle with real life tensions inherent in using artificial intelligence to study human behavior grounded in the violence prevention. And so our work sits between two critical issues. Black families wanting their children to be safe and desiring tools that help achieve these ends and digital surveillance and policing enacting and enhancing yet another form of state violence on black people and communities. Researching involving public available social media data has the potential to indirectly impact study populations in harmful ways. Ethical obligations include clarity of the context and potential vulnerabilities that are specific to each study population, adopting various mechanisms to protect, protect the study population, encrypting and de-identifying de data, and ensuring that research does not amplify, amplify vulner vulnerabilities or create further marginalizational harm. And so while research uses publicly available tweets, the users in our data set who are Black youth face varying levels of marginalization, criminalization, and police surveillance on and offline. And so we contend with the fact that although our system is arguably accurate or more accurate because we leverage qualitative insights and context, a more accurate system might also indicate harm in this context. And so the ability to automatically identify aggressive and threatening content from Black youth can also be used as evidence in the criminal justice system, creating an automated pipeline towards further incarceration. And so with these various considerations in mind, we implemented various mechanisms to protect our study population from further harm. First, before annotators are given access to the data set, they are required to sign a, a, the um, ethical annotation agreement. This agreement includes steps for accountability if one of the practices are not followed. Second, when sharing our work through publications and presentations, we de-identify de all social media posts, rendering the text um, unsearchable and use images from Flickr, um, Creative Commons, rather than our, from our data set to avoid shining a spotlight on our users in the sea of social media posts. And third, we only share our data set with community partners and other researchers who sign a memorandum of understanding outlining intentions and purposes for using social media data set. These are just a few things. I don't think this is, this is an exhaustive list. I think there's much more we can do. And I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on what we can do to protect young people, to keep everyone safe in this process. And so again, as I mentioned, the, the whole purpose for me as a social worker, social work 
social work practitioners, social work scientists, is to really help community outreach workers and social workers um, uh, be able to leverage social media as a part of their violence prevention process. But again, we have to stop and think about who's gonna use it and, and, and when, uh, when these tools are not applied equitably. So here are some clear examples, right? So on the left, we have black men from Harlem, just north of Columbia, uh, that were arrested, who were surveilled for years uh, because of their Facebook um, engagement and images that they were in. And then we have two white male shooters that murdered many people in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. But yet, their social media accounts and uh, uh, engagement on social media was only found after the fact. And so being able to sit with this particular inequity is another important issue. And so we are beginning to write about the um, digital stop and frisk that is also happening within communities of color as well. And so for me, an important part of this work is to really um, change who was at the table, who was doing the work, who was a part of the conversations um, to re redirect um, and create new pipelines of youth of color that become technologists or people that use technology regularly to protect their own communities. And so one of the things is that I created a digital youth lab at the Brownsville Community Justice Center here in New York City. And I partnered with these young people to create sets of simulations, to do educations around technology use, um, encoding and uh, um, user research to, ho to hopefully create a new cadre of black and brown folk that are now the folks that are creating the technologies. One of the things that these young people have created is the Blue Room. And this is a Facebook-like simulation that we partner with um, a team at MIT to create. Um, and the whole purpose is this, this is for young people to be able to practice different ways of being online, practice different, um, different ways of showing up in online spaces so that they can have a better sense of how they're showing up and, and can make the most informed decisions around how they're showing up in digital space as well. Uh, they also created Interpret Me, which is another clinical simulation that we partner with with the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT. And the goal, this is for adult stakeholders. This is for law enforcement, attorneys and judges, educators, anyone who might be using social media to, to interpret human behavior. And the goal of this particular simulation that, um, that is really important for the youth is they wanted practitioners to have opportunities to interpret social media posts, to get additional context, and to really wrestle with non-punitive ways of responding. And so the user will go through a set of um, videos and um, um, audios with actors to really practice its interpretation, not to, get, not to become better at interpretation, but to check biases and ideas of racism that come through when people are interpreting social media posts. And so I just wanna kind of go through a few um, takeaways that I think are important. Um, I think that uh, for social media more generally, I think um, communities where youth live, social media is a place where communities, is a, is a community where youth live their lives and it's not necessarily distinct from their actual life. I also think that social media can be a very powerful tool for understanding and preventing root causes of violence. I think that artificial intelligence offers an opportunity to augment and to bolster um, current violence prevention efforts I also think that we can change how we're using artificial intelligence. And so in the work, in the work that we've done, the work that I've seen um, happening, that is always focused on aggression and violence and threats. And now, based on the work that I've done over the last eight years, I now know that if that's your focus, that you're too late, that you have missed an opportunity to radically engage youth in their day-to-day -day life, um, to ask questions about safety, about joy, about happiness, about resources. And so artificial intelligence can really be used to unearth some of the challenges and some of the strengths that youth and communities uh, possess as well. Um, and also it's never used equitably. We're not using it to uh, analyze the social media posts of white youth in Chicago or more affluent youth in other parts of the world. And then an important note is that these tools should not be used in a vacuum. They're not the sole answer. Um, to any of these problems. And we have to think about how we are um, inclusive and who is a part of the, de the decision-making process with um, when we use the tools and how we use the tools. 
Um, I think that context is extremely important when interpreting social media posts. Um, it's also important that we focus on um, uncovering bias and racism at the personal and institutional level when considering using social media for any violence prevention efforts. And as I, as I said before, this work should not be done alone. Um, it's important that you have a critical and diverse perspective in the application of any of these tools as well. And so I come back to this picture because this is a very different view of Jakaira, a very different view of Jakaira that I did not have coming into this work. But because we hired domain experts, because we in, engaged in qualitative analysis, because we sat with her data for hours and hours and hours, we saw a different Jakaira that the news didn't tell us, that we didn't see in the beginning. We saw someone who loved. We saw someone who wanted to protect her family. We saw someone that, um, that had so much joy and had a future. Um, and there's so much potential in that, but if we don't get this right, we can not see this young woman for the complexity of who she is. We cannot, we can grossly dehumanize her and other black youth, other brown youth in ways that is extremely problematic. And so I wanted to leave us with this picture of a young woman that I now see, that I now understand, that I now feel in very different ways than I did at the beginning of my research. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Desmond, so much for the very exciting talk. Actually, this is, was really useful. And I think we now have a few questions already. Uh, I will just remind uh, uh, actually participants who are actually around 200 already. So if you can vote up uh, the questions, there are a few questions already uh, asked. If you'd like to vote up some of those questions to put your prize, if you have to uh, add a new question, please do so. So for now, actually, I will go with uh, some of these questions, if you don't mind. So I think, okay, the, the first question we have is, are the tools you have developed already accurate enough to have an impact on the communities uh, in question? If so, is it clear whether or not the impact so far has been more helpful than harmful? So I think yeah, this is a very valid question now. Yeah, and that's a really good question. And I would say no, uh, the tools are not accurate enough. And I think where I sit now, I'm not sure that accuracy should be the goal. Um, and, and quite honestly, we have really taken a step back from focusing on aggression and threats to really focusing on trauma and loss and grief. We see that as being more of an entry point, more of a better understanding of understanding the pathway to more aggressive and violent conversations. And so, no, uh, we have spent the last five years just really trying to work on the tools and work on the data science piece because the stakes are too high. If we get this wrong um, and other people use these tools, the stakes are too high for black youth um, and from brown youth. And I'm okay with that. Um, I'm not, so um, I think there are other ways to support outreach workers. I think that we have been able to have conversations about different approaches. We've been able to involve them and to have different trainings on how they can do their own annotation of social media as well. So I think there are other ways to approach it as well. Um, but no, I think that we are still working on how do we do this well, how do we, um, and um, rethinking whether or not accuracy is the best um, metric for this very vulnerable population. Okay, but I think uh, maybe a follow up on this, uh, because what part of the question was, how would you be sure it's more he helpful than harmful? Uh, how, did you try to measure the impact of those? No, so we have not deployed or integrated these tools in the community, right? And so I think that one of the ways in which we would be able to do that is to partner with a violence prevention organization and to have them do a pilot study. And we have been applying for grants to do that. Um, and we have not received funding to be able to do that because there are a lot of ethical concerns around what happens when you have these tools in these communities, right? And so it, it is forcing us to rethink how do we do this in a way that keeps everyone safe and um, um, highlights the humanity of the experiences that young black people are going through um, in the city of Chicago. And so I think, um, I think that's, that's an excellent question, um, but I think that that will require um, a partnership with these organizations and some uh, pilot testing to begin with. Uh -huh. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so uh, I think a second uh, popular and related question is, uh, language use can change quite quickly over time on social media. Does this prevent a, uh, present a challenge in using these models to make an accurate present day predictions? 
especially when there are ethical considerations in using up-to-date data instead of historical data? I think this is really relevant to uh, the previous question. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So number one, honestly, so we've been looking at social media data for years now, and we're not seeing such dramatic changes in language. That's oftentimes the question that I get. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not seeing that. That's not, that hasn't been true for the populations that I work with. What we see, what I think is really important and why having youth involvement is extremely critical is that there are cha language changes with music. And so when there's a new song or a new rapper or new musician, oftentimes the language that we see that unfolds in social media is a, uh, a representation of how music is also shifting as well. But when we have youth involvement in that process and we keep, um, keep them involved in every part of the process, we're able to keep track. So that also means that, you know, for us to do our work well, we can't, we have to have humans in the loop with every um, process. Um, we also, in our data system, um, in our data sets, we do kind of regular cleaning of the data set as well. And so if there's a user that has, that is no longer active or that has set their accounts to private, we take them out of the data sets. Um, if they're, is new a new word or a new set of um, uh, words that we haven't uh, seen before? We will identify those words and try to put some definitions around them um, in conjunction with our domain experts to make sure that we are uh, currently relative. But no, I, 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 by no means do I think that this is a particular process that should just be extracted to every community um, because the language. Um, let, me, let me back up. One of the things that was really interesting is that I did this presentation, a uh, uh, formative presentation years ago in London, and we had uh, Black youth from Brixton looking at the social media posts from youth in Chicago. And they were able to grapple with about 70% of the context because of music. So music was the uh, factor that made everyone kind of knowledgeable around certain language. Um, but again, there were just very specific things around streets and schools and institutions that are so specific to a neighborhood that only someone from that neighborhood would understand. And also when we had youth from Chicago looking at other youth from Chicago's uh, uh, social media posts and trying to translate and interpret, they had a high level of variability in their interpretation as well. So I think this language piece is something really important, something that we need to continue to study as well. But I do think there are large buckets and categories of, of actions that I think remain true even on a global context when we think about music. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, okay, another popular question. Uh, do you believe that the platforms are doing enough to label and uh, to make the depromotion of aggression on their platforms in order to protect young people? Not at all. Um, I, first of all, I, I don't think they have the right people involved in that process. Um, and I, I, think, I think the bottom line has been too focused on their bottom line and not on the protection of young people, not on the protection of all of us. Right, and I, I think that um, we have to have really complicated conversations, right? And so one of the things that I've been doing, I've, I've had many conversations with different platforms and, and, and trying to help them to disaggregate how they focus on youth that are gang involved or might live in communities with high rates of violence versus, um, you know, um, uh, right wing or um, hate groups as well. Because oftentimes they would be in the same, uh, bucket of kind of uh, policies and practices, um, but there's a very big, very big differences in those individual uh, uh, user experiences and why they're showing up on social media in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, another question. Uh, how can we progress in social media AI for health, information keeping, AI ethics, uh, and policies in place. Uh, it is growing important every day to create responsible AI while keeping AI ethics in place to create values that will support social systems. Uh, please share your thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I struggle with this. I'm not sure if ethics is the right language, the right word, and I'm not sure what the right word is, but I always struggle with this because I, what I come back to is who ethics are we privileging and centering in this space, right? And so do we privilege the ethics and experiences of the Black youth that I just uh, talked about? Or is it from a philosopher at some elite institution who's telling us how we should think about the world? And so I, um, I think until we blow that up, I'm very concerned around, around this like um, broad-based use of um, um, 
ethics as a way of uh, covering our butts without doing the hard work, right? And so I think at the same time we're having conversations around um, ethics, we can also be having the same hard conversations around uh, racial equity. And I think the conversations are actually pretty similar and require really hard self um, self identity work. Um, that should probably come before we decide that we're going to have this framework that's deployed for everyone to use. Okay, I think related to this, uh, uh, if we have this analysis at a granular level uh, on particular social networks, how do you balance this with the risks of users feeling they are losing their privacy uh, and thus move to another network, potentially an anonymous one? Yeah, I don't. I don't fully know. Um, in, in the work that I've done, youth would um, be anchored in multiple platforms anyway, and so it wasn't necessarily it wasn't necessarily the case that they were like, "Oh, someone's looking at my data. Let me jump to Instagram or let me jump to TikTok." It was uh, Twitter's boring. It's old. Facebook boring, it's old. I'm just gonna be on this other platform. Now there are some youth that are very savvy and very much um, uh, navigating platforms in that way, but it wasn't typically the case. Uh, but also, I think youth are brilliant and they're very good at also figuring out how to protect themselves as well. So over the, over the years, we're, we have seen youth become much more savvy with how to curate their identities online and how to protect themselves, right? So when we would have these qualitative interviews with young people, you know, later in the year, we were um, realizing that they were much more savvy about how they would navigate privacy and data protection in ways that we didn't know or they weren't saying a few years earlier as well. So I, I think that um, things are um, changing, um, but, I, but, but I think the hardest part is this issue around privacy and safety, right? And so, for example, you know, we're okay with giving up some of our rights to go through a scanner at the airport because we believe it keeps us safe while we're on the plane. Can the same be true about the use of AI in social media monitoring and analysis? Um, and, and I don't have evidence that suggests that the same can be true right now, but I don't think that it can't get to that place. Um, but again, we're gonna to have to have some really complicated and hard conversations around how we're using these tools and why we're using them in the first place. And if we're only using them as a negative character testimony or a punitive solution to long-standing historical contextual problems, and it's probably not going to work. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's my follow-up on this uh, before taking another question, uh, because we mentioned other platforms, but and you mentioned TikTok and maybe Snapchat. This actually, I think, this is what is currently trending, especially with young people. So, yep. do you think that this would be this work that you're doing would be applicable on these kinds of platforms? And what are the benefits if, uh, assuming, I know it might require more technology than just because it's on text. Uh, and what would be, assuming it's doable or not, uh, assume, once, assuming it's doable, what would be the benefits of doing this with the new platforms coming up right now, like TikTok, for example? Yeah, well, I think the same issues show up on TikTok. So I am an avid TikTok watcher. I love TikTok. <laughs> and I'm seeing, I'm, I'm beginning to see videos, a lot of videos around grief and loss, and I'm seeing more videos around fights. Um, I think what's interesting about having the video um, content is that you can also see what other types of content the user is sharing in a deeper and more robust way, right? And so it's not, you can do similar things with text, but video gives you, it feels like a more robust um, window into the world of the user that is sharing that content. Uh, and then you also have the same features of being able to comment on the video as well. And we, can, we, we see that on TikTok and Instagram um, um, and Snap as well. Um, again, I, I think that it allows us to get a more holistic view of people. And we can see not just the actual event, but being able to have hopefully some longitudinal data around the world that a young person is embedded in and what that world can tell us about what, what, what are the needs of young people. And that's what I think is really missing from this work um, of this work moving forward um, um, in a global way is that mo so much of what I see just kind of sits on social media platforms, right? And so, 
loss and grief and deep pain, traumatic pain, and it's just kind of hanging out on social media platforms. And but we're so interested in only the most like dramatic aspects of that that young people are hurting and they're and they're telling us, and yet we're we're not able to do anything about it because we're not. I don't think we're focused on the right um, entry points. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just before I continue, uh, uh, I can see more questions are coming. You can stop. So <laughs> I'm just asking if, uh, uh, participants, please, if you'd like to vote the existing ones, uh, we uh, it would be useful just before posting your questions. Uh, okay, so the next one is, uh, okay, the question is, so do you think that publicly available social media activity should be used at all in social care systems? Mm. Maybe just for uh, non uh, uh, punitively. So what do you think about this? That's a great question. I think that there are opportunities with social media. I think that social media can be extremely useful when we have a set of non-negotiables in terms of how we will use it, when we use it, and when we will not use it, when we have a highly inclusive um, group of people that are making those decisions. And so I definitely think that it, I just learned so much about the complexity of the lived experience for youth and the complexity of the lived experience for youth in this pandemic. We're learning so much about the resources that they do and do not have. We're learning so much about how they are learning during this time. We're learning so much about substance use and, um, and the things that they're doing so well. We're learning about their strengths and how we could potentially capitalize on those strengths to build stronger systems. And so I, I think there's a missed opportunity when we don't ask better questions of social media. So yeah, I, I do think that it can be useful, um, but we have to have the right people at the table and you have to have really hard conversations. Okay, excellent. Uh, okay, another popular question. Uh, could you speak more about the benefit of thinking about grief, loss, and trauma? Uh, how could these be used in contrast slash comparison to the work that relates to risk of violence? Yeah, so I think, so we did a study looking at the relationship between grief and aggression. And what we learned is two things. One, that grief and aggression were not randomly distributed in our Twitter uh, data set. And number two, that grief oftentimes preceded more aggressive posts. And they preceded aggressive posts within a two day window. And so that process would look like a young person would experience something in the neighborhood, their family, their community. They would use Twitter as a place to kind of talk through that post, or I'm sorry, um, talk through that experience, talk through that pain. And then again, it would sit on the platform and then everybody in their network um, had something could, could say something whether that's positive or negative and or they can also screenshot that pain and send it to rival groups or rival organizations or people that don't like them to instigate future violence as well and so for me it opened my eyes to a number of things number one social media is a help-seeking device <laughs> a help-seeking tool but we never really talk about it like that. Um, but I, we see it happening over and over again. And sometimes we may not even be aware that we're using it as a help seeking tool because we're just sharing our life. But sharing your life, you know, as a social worker is something that we do in a clinical setting day in and day out anyway. It's about processing and getting through deep and complex issues in our lives and having a space, whether that someone talks to you apparently um, is provide some uh, soothing effect. Um, but I think there could, what I'm wondering in my own work is, are there ways to help people deal with that complex trauma before their speech and posting behavior becomes more aggressive? Uh, there is room for anger, right? So anger is a, part of, is, is a part of our daily life. It is an emotion that we all hold and it's not a, necessarily a bad emotion, um, but within an ecology of violence, within a context of violence, that anger could be very different. So how do we help at least people process that grief in a way that is healthy? And can we prevent the type of anger that might unfold when it's untreated? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's really excellent. Uh, okay, another questions. Another, there are many actually, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me ask them as they are sorted by popularity. 
So uh, first of all, I want to thanking you for the excellent talk, which we all do. Uh, do. Uh, and the question is, social media use by law enforcement is uh, inequitable. Uh, would you advocate for extra effort to be spent by law enforcement on investigating white communities and potential offenders on social media? Or should social media be removed from investigations? What do you think about this? I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that I, I'm not convinced yet that social media is the greatest strategy for policing. And so while, yes, <laughs> if we're going to deploy these systems that they should be deployed equitably in, in the white communities, I'm not quite, I'm not sure. I don't have the evidence that would suggest that we should be using it as a policing strategy anyway. Um, police, particularly in the United States, have not yet dealt with issues of racism and bias in traditional policing. So uh, having a different context to apply it to, I think amplifies issues of racism and bias that are already existing in these, in these long-standing historical systems. And so until we deal with the day-to-day, -day, the everyday occurrences of racism and bias in policing, I'm not a huge fan of deploying it in technology systems that are widespread, that are broad, and that can act and react more quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe kind of related. Uh, do you believe that this technology uh, that this technology will be more effective when the major underlying problems of racism and, equ and equ inequality uh, in the world are approached and hopefully dealt with? Maybe, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you know, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't, I don't have a, a clear answer for that. I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, um, I have some hope, uh, but I'm, you know, reserving a little bit of, of that for my own sanity. Um, yeah, I think we have a lot to learn. I think there's so much work to happen that I don't even want to speculate into the future around that yet until I until I see some clear evidence that we are really moving and we get these glimmers and glimpses and kind of, you know, little flickers that, that can be really exciting. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna hold off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, again, another question about the technology. Uh, in the context of your research and interest, what technology do you wish existed and what uh, would it help achieve? What technology do I wish existed? Yeah, we can see your perspective. You're collaborating with people doing NLP, doing with uh, computer vision. What kind of additional technologies, or additional, or actually maybe in these technologies, would be uh, you wish it would exist to help you more? Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily interested in new, in new technologies. What I am interested in, and what I've been kind of dabbling in, is virtual reality, um, because I do think that virtual reality. And the advances in virtual reality have the ability to kind of put people in someone else's shoes. And I think that that is an instrument. Like the issues that I'm studying, they're not just about social media and violence, they're also about race, right? And I think that the story of violence and gun violence in any country, uh, but particularly in the United States, is, a, is a one about race. And I think that we, we have an issue where we care more about violence and gun violence when uh the people look like us and so i think when they look like you and so we have to figure out how to build more empathy around these particular issues so that we can at least be on the same page around why these issues are problematic and so i think that the use of virtual reality in this space uh, i think could be extremely helpful and, um, and impactful Okay, I think this is a message for those uh, working in virtu virtual reality to contact you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how to <please> do. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, maybe a very quick question. Uh, he uh, from our, uh, uh, they are wondering if the data set you mentioned is publicly available or they can get it. So we only the only data set that is available is the is the smaller thick data one, and we would have to. Um, write to us and uh, fill out an MOU and we would need to have a discussion around your use of that data. The larger data sets, um, we have had discussions around 
possibly lending out some of the code um, in that space, but not the actual social media post. Um, but that's, a, that, that's something that we're thinking through. Okay, so I think uh, if they are interested in the data, they just need to contact you. About yes. It. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, there is a comment about uh, that uh, it's uh, it's uh, th they are thanking you, and this is such a sad topic, but necessary to be uh, discussed. Which yeah, we all thank you about this. And uh, okay, another one is: is it ethical to not just social discourse away from toxic uh, voices and posting more positive voices? Do you think so? If like we can take this and try to boost positive voices from uh, toxic voices. And what are the ethical considerations about this? What do you think about it? Sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Okay, the that? question exactly is, is it ethical to nudge social discourse away from toxic voices and posting more uh, positive voices? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I've, I've had discussions around this with various social media platforms around how do we amplify um, not just more positive voices, but more positive content. Um, and I think that that is a part of like, well, how do we, how do we create healthy dialogue uh, on social media? But it always comes back to, well, who, like, who, who is positive, what's positive, what's healthy? And I would have to say that, you know, the, the content that you see from the youth in Chicago to some regard can be deemed as healthy to be to be able to say the thing that you may not say in person in online space could be a coping function. The issue is what happens after that post. Um, but in one in, in one moment, it could be adaptive and another it could be maladaptive. And so um, I, I like the idea of it having a lot more positive content, um, but again, I, I'm not sure that that type of content would be inclusive. Yeah, okay. I think this relates to the Facebook study uh, four or five years ago, and it created a lot of discussion yes, uh, between yes. every community. Yeah. Okay, so uh, another question. Uh, your studies have been uh, based in uh, South Chicago. So how difficult is it to ex extrapolate the conclusions of these studies to other communities? Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, I think that number one, we're seeing the same types of behaviors in many communities out in the US and outside of the US. I think the difference, I think the challenge is the issue with um, interpretation, right? Um, the types of methodologies that we use are um, highly generalizable. Um, I think what, we're, what we've been trying to focus on is perhaps helping people think about a process for doing the work that they could be applied in their community. But the ins and outs and the nuances of that would have to be a function of your community. But hiring local people to be a part of your research process is something that any and everyone can do. And I think not only can it make your data set better and stronger, but you can actually create pipelines of new, a new workforce in this space as well. And it helps you to, it helps to have people that can hold you accountable in this space as well. And so um, I do think there, there are pieces of the work that can be extracted and generalizable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, could the tools you have developed be used to help social workers intervene at an early stage uh, in the mental, emotional health issues that eventually lead to aggression? aggression? And would this uh, present fewer ethical problems? What do you think? That is the, yeah, great question. Love it. Um, that's actually what we're doing now. And so we have a new grant to focus on grief and loss. And we're building out a platform, uh, particularly around COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, so that um, we're, we're doing comparative study between Columbia undergraduate students in the Harlem community, which is predominantly Black in New York City. And we're going to have people um, write in um, responses to their grief and loss as it relates to COVID-19 as relates to what's happening with anti-Black racism. Um, and we're gonna study that um, as a way of being able to support um, how social, uh, uh, social workers and other mental health practitioners can identify um, early warning signs that happen in, in a digital context that are oftentimes not a part of the um, clinical interview that may happen with a social worker. Okay, this is great news, I think. So uh, hopefully you'll be successful with that and we'll be following this. 
Uh, and I think actually there are a couple of comments uh, which is uh, is actually asking if the, if there is a way that we can contribute and help in diversifying all uh, all of this research all over the world. And so uh, I think uh, people are excited to help in this. I, I you know I would love to have a community of folks that care about this topic and that can expand it. Uh, uh, globally, I think there's room to have a network of people that are doing this in very different places. We can learn from each other and create. What I would love to do is create really strong ethical tools that are hyper inclusive and that um, not only help us to um, reduce violence um, and to support mental health issues, but also create new pipelines of people that are involved in this work as well. There are very few people in my world that look like me that are doing this work. And so I would love to see that shift and change as well. Okay, so I, uh, if you don't mind, I think those who are interested to help, they can just get in please touch do. with you. Please do. Yeah, so that'd be great. So I think uh, that uh, uh, we got a lot of questions now, and uh, we are already tired. I hope you are okay. <laughs> Sorry for giving you all of this, uh, but uh, I'd like actually uh, that to thank you so much for uh, your time and for your very exciting. Uh, talk and actually very interesting work that hopefully has a very positive impact on the community. And uh, I'd like actually to thank all the participants for uh, joining us on this and this afternoon and fantastic talk. And for the, all the questions, I'm sorry if I missed some of them, but uh, uh, we are kind of running out of time now. So um, actually, I just uh, kind of an announcement at the end that uh, we will be hosting the final of this series of virtual Turing lectures on the 22nd of September. It will be actually with the founder and chairman of Boston Dynamics. I think everyone knows uh, Boston Dynamics and they're uh, very uh, nice robots. It will be Mark uh, uh, Raybert, uh, who will be exploring the use of robotic, robotics uh, throughout the pandemic. And uh, you can register for this event and more on our website. So please follow us and uh, you will get all the updates. Uh, finally, finally, now on behalf of everyone and the Alan Turing Institute, I'd like actually to thank uh, Dr. Patton so much for his time and for joining us today. Thank you so much.